I've just returned from a place so piercingly cold, it gives me the shivers just thinking about it. It's not Antarctica or even the top of Mount Everest. No, it's actually a tiny village in central Siberia. In Oymyakon, it's so cold your eyelashes freeze together and you're constantly on guard against frostbite. If it's warmer than minus 55 degrees Celsius, then it's a good day. So rug up as we venture to the coldest town in the world. The icy journey to Oymyakon is a long, treacherous drive across Siberia, with the temperature plummeting by the hour. It takes two days and nights on roads as slippery as glass. Inevitably, one of our backup vehicles came to grief along the way. There's something terribly haunting about this road to Oymikon. It was built in the times of that dreadful tyrant, Joseph Stalin, to link a series of gulags or prison camps. The political prisoners were used as unpaid labour. Indeed, they were used to death, collapsing from exposure at the horrific rate of one every metre. Now think about that, that's one dead, two dead, three dead, and so the death and misery continued for 1,200 kilometres. More than a million people died constructing this. Little wonder they call it the road of bones. Each time a person died, they just left them on the road and incorporated their bones into the aggregate. What just bulldozed them into the surface? So quite literally, the road of bones. I'm with a man highly qualified in extreme environments, Nick Middleton, a travel writer and geographer from Oxford University. Most of the, uh, the slave labour wouldn't have been kitted out like we are, and they just literally worked them to death. So, so in reality, for the last two days, we've been driving across a million people. It's a thought, isn't it? And it's true. To get to the coldest town on earth, we cross two frozen rivers, climb a mountain range, and traverse endless forests to a remote speck on the map, smack bang in the middle of Siberia. Finally, our destination, Oymyakon, population 547. Here we are, at last. Prepare yourself for the, the big freeze. First stop is the town square, a small monument to honour the man who recorded the record low. This is the temperature, minus 71.2. That's the coldest ever recorded in an inhabited town. I take it this is the fellow who this is the guy did the who, recording. Who took the readings, his name's Obachev. He was a geographer, explorer, writer, and um, he recorded the temperature in the 1920s. And he was freezing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he was. It's hard to describe the intensity of the cold, except to say that your freezer at home runs at minus 18 degrees. And when we drove into town, it was minus 45. Although the town's mayor thought today's weather was quite mild. It's warm now. This is warm. Yeah, it's, it's warm now. <laughs> the locals say it's truly cold when it dips below minus 50, when blood stops flowing to exposed skin and frostbite sets in. The worst thing here is that uh, you can underestimate the cold and you're not realising when your parts of your body are frozen. And you know what, your, the end of your nose is going. Is it? Yeah, it's right. going a waxy colour. OK, well that's not good. No, it isn't. I'm going to get back in the car. Yeah, OK. No, no kidding, it is, it's gone all white. All right, thanks, so for, straight thanks for coming. Okay. We hurried to our accommodation. There are no hotels and a local family agreed to put us up. The native Yakuts have distinctive Asiatic features and live much as they've done for centuries. 
Next to the wood pile is an ice pile. Ice blocks are melted inside for fresh water. Tamara, you've lived here all your life. It must be a very hard existence. Yes, there are difficulties in anyone's life, but it's good here. If I had a choice to live anywhere in the world, it would be here. Tamara, in your lifetime, what's the coldest day you've experienced? When I was a little girl, it was minus 68 one day. It's never been as cold since then. One of the many day-to-day -day hardships of living in a place like this, aside from the temperature, and this morning it's minus 54, beauty, is the complete lack of running water. These places have no pipes. I mean, apart from the money, it'd be no good putting them in anyway because the water would freeze instantly. And that means there's no showers and no baths, which is not so bad in these conditions. But that means there's also no flushing toilet, which leads me to this. Now, the old-fashioned thunderbox is fine if you're in outback Australia, but let me tell you, when you're in the coldest part of the world and nature calls in the middle of the night, you have to come and get your kid off. Well, that's something else. Oymyakon is only 700 metres above sea level and is well below the Arctic Circle. But the reason it's so cold is a unique function of geography. There's no ocean nearby to moderate the extreme conditions. And it's deep in a frigid valley. And sitting in the bottom of this valley, all the cold air tends to accumulate. And that combination of factors adds up to the coldest inhabited town on Earth. The people who live here, I think there are certain common factors. I haven't seen any tall people here. And that makes physiological sense because it minimises the amount of um, surface area they have to lose heat from. It's the same as the Yakut horses. They're short, squat creatures. Yakut horses have adapted so well, they stay outdoors 24-7. Their one weak spot is that the ice accumulates on their backs. Not surprised. So they have to de-ice the, de the... De-ice the horse. Every month or so in winter, farmers round them up for a procedure you'd see nowhere but here. So they've got these really thick combs to scrape the ice off. So, okay, what do they use these horses for? Mainly for meat. For meat. For meat. Horse meat, morning, noon and night. We'll get pretty bored of it by the end. Liam, <coughs> what okay, you below minus 50, this trick effect is supposed to work. Another day in the deep freeze, and it was cold enough for Nick to try some experiments he'd read about studying geography. <clears throat> this is boiling water, I've taken it just off the stove, you can see the steam. Yeah. Right, you watch, I'm going to throw the, air, the water up into the air. Right, ready? Yep. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How good is that? <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? It just immediately freezes in the atmosphere and turns to snow, plus a bit of residual steam. It's extraordinary, isn't it? <sighs> it's amazing. <laughs> Washing presents some uh, interesting effects in this part of the world, Liam. And now, stand up yeah. and swing it round your head. Swing it round my swing head? Swing it round your head, please. Right. <sighs> A bit longer. This is how you dry it here, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> All we're effectively doing is speeding up the process of hanging it on the line. Oh, OK. OK, stop now. See <sighs> what uh, effect you've got. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Look at you that. were doing that for about 10 seconds, and now look at it. That is amazing. Look. I've never tried this, but you're supposed to be able to split it down the middle quite easily. So, yeah, what, try your, that. Your favourite T-shirt? Yeah, yeah. It's an old one. Yeah, look at that. Oh.
But nothing illustrated the deep freeze better than Nick's final party trip. I left a couple of uh, bananas out last night. <laughs> Have you ever seen a nail hammered in with a banana? <laughs> I can honestly say no. Possibly not. OK. Totally ridiculous. And yet... Look at that. Totally effective. Look at that. You leave me off there, Nick. The thing that struck me most about this place was that no matter how frigid the weather, the townsfolk just grin and bear it. On the coldest day of our journey, the local reindeer herder offered to take us to see his best mate, a fisherman named Igor. Hey, listen, without any reindeer, there'd be no Oymyakon because the whole town grew up on a place where reindeer herders used to spend the night next to the river. It's a highly unusual way to go fishing, though. <laughs> the reindeer dropped us at the local river, where Igor was already making holes in the ice. At minus 54, the frostbite hazard on exposed skin is serious and the fisherman noticed my nose had turned white again. Well, he's saying your nose is uh, frozen. Right, I'll cover up. Oh, yeah. The method is ingenious. Where does the net run to? It goes to that hole. Over there? Yeah. Two holes about five metres apart, with a net slung under the ice between them. Igor rarely goes home without a bucket full of fish. Ooh, oh, here we go. Bare hands too. Come on, that fishy boy. Oh, yes! Oh, yes. yes. Well done. <sighs> Brilliant. There you go, your beauty. Nature provides in abundance here. Look at that. Oh, and another one. Gosh, oh. you get a lot. The local legend has it that when God was creating the earth, he got so cold that his hands went numb and he dropped the lot in Oymyakon. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. Yep. Frozen solid already, look. Yeah. Today being 54 below, school kids missed out on a day off by just one degree. If it's minus 55, the school says it's too dangerous to leave home. The children farewelled us from Oymyakon with a dance and warned us not to come back when the weather warms up. It gets to plus 35 in the summer months and apparently it's unbearable. In summer, it gets very hot. It gets very swampy when everything melts. Um, the, the air is full of mosquitoes and black fly, and it's an extremely unpleasant place. I wouldn't like to live here. I don't think I could live here, actually, both for those climatic conditions and also the remoteness and that combination, that package. I don't think I could do it. It's hard yards, isn't it? Very hard, very hard life. Hello, I'm Tara Brown. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.